Vislava Zimborska. Her poetry is like, wow, it's a wonderful gift. <laughs> We're going to be examining authorial choice, which is uh, something that we do when we're dissecting a poem, taking it apart, figuring out, I mean, ultimately it's about meaning, it's about what matters, it's about why the poem was created and should be understood as a gift uh, for us people who remain. And uh, if you're in IB class, and you probably are, you're going to also be uh, attuned to those authorial choices and how do they surface, examine, complicate, uh, present a vision of a global issue. Something that matters to the whole world. So I'll start by reading this one. And then uh, authorial choices. Poetry is great uh, for examining authorial choice because there's just so many of them to choose from. I'll give you the first one right here. It's actually two. This is an ellipsis and there's an ellipsis in the title so an ellipsis indicates a a certain sound to how it should be read um, but also generally what it indicates is like there is a, something that's being unsaid something that's important that's being unsaid and uh, choosing to put that in the title and then to mirror those the the title and the first line are identical except for the punctuation um, this is a dash right here. So the title should technically be read slightly different than this line right here. We knew the world backwards and forwards. Could you hear it? Could you hear something missing? Uh, so that's choice number one. Choice number two, I already mentioned, was to have the first line and the title be identical. That is choice number two. So because I want to move through as many choices as possible, I'm just going to number them. Uh, I don't think I'm going to fully annotate them. Um, I will use words like metaphor and simile and parallel and uh, the kind of language that you want to use, but you'll have to take those annotations yourself next to the numbers. We knew the world backwards and forwards. So small it fit in a handshake. So easy it could be described in a smile as plain as the echoes of old truths in a prayer. History did not greet us with triumphant fanfare. It flung dirty sand in our eyes. Ahead of us were distant roads leading nowhere, poisoned wells, bitter bread. The spoils of war is our knowledge of the world. So large it fits in a handshake, so hard it could be described in a smile as strange as the echoes of old truths in a prayer. I'm going to talk about them one by one. So, well, I'm, so structure. So in poems, structure is a key choice. And so sometimes when you're talking about choices in poems, you're not using like the fancy words like metaphor or in jammed line or things that are specific. You might be talking about things like sentences because uh, choice number three, which is a structure, has to do with, so stanzas, she has three stanzas. The stanza is poetry's equivalent to a paragraph. They are equal, four lines each. Four lines, four lines, four lines. First one is a sentence. The second one is two sentences. And the third one returns to a sentence. In fact, it returns in several ways. So structure, what did I just talk about? Sentences. So the choice in sentence and stanza is what I was just talking about. So sentence and stanza, there's a parallel structure. So structure, she uses a lot of parallels, a lot of like parallels that, are, that operate like at the level of the poem. So between stanzas, there's a parallel in fit, in a handshake, it fits in a handshake and could be described 
and a smile. Could be described in a smile. And then echoes of old truths and a prayer. So we're going to call that a parallel structure. So parallel is anything where there's a where there's correspondence between sometimes it's the structure of a sentence but here there's actually a parallel in the language that's used except we have opposites. So what does this structure do? Okay, so there's another little that's another choice. So she's building something where opposites are important and parallel opposites. So that's a that's not a fancy word, and that's just the word opposite. So we have opposites. Small becomes large. So what's happening? That really balances. So, so this becomes key because we have a large transition or change between this stanza and this stanza. Small becomes large. Easy becomes hard. Plain becomes strange. So that's transformation. Choice number six. I'm just changing colors because my blue is smudgy. So six is kind of like a um, transformation. And what trans... So now we're back to structure because, it, because this stanza becomes what's in between. So if this is one vision of the world, we knew the world. We knew the world. So what has changed? The world has changed. Knowledge of the world. So it's really a structural choice that allows us to, to make this middle stanza like a pivot point. So here's a point of change, of transformation. In what? Knowledge of the world. We knew the world or knowledge of the world. And this is the change from small to large, from easy to hard, from plain to strange. So. The second stanza, because it's two sentences and it doesn't follow the parallel structure, is special. It has special emphasis. emphasis. So you could say things like, she chose to structure the second stanza with two sentences instead of the following the pattern that she established and then, re and then, and then uh, continued in the third stanza. So, what happens in these sentences? History did not greet us with triumphant fanfare. It flung dirty sand in our eyes. Flung dirty sand in your eyes is a clear image. It's like, bam. Okay, it's also personification. What did the flinging? History did the flinging. Well, that's what? History doesn't fling things. History... Oh, I see. History personified flings dirty sand in our eyes. The choice of a pronoun. So not their eyes, not his eyes, not her eyes, but our eyes invites a question. So the choice of our eyes. So that's a choice in pronoun. In our eyes. Also, look at the length. Look at the syllables. History did not greet us with triumphant fanfare. It flung dirty sand in our eyes. So there's something happening rhythmically here that I'm not going to get into, but the rhythm brings out the emphasis of flung dirty sand in our eyes. So there's a choice in rhythm. 
ahead of us were distant roads leading nowhere. Roads leading nowhere is a paradox. Choice 11. She uses paradox right here to help us understand something that seems impossible. You can have a road that goes nowhere. Well, maybe, maybe you can. Maybe you can because what road is it? You know, has she said, used the word war yet? Echoes of old truths. No. No, here's where we have, we still don't know. So there's a structural choice. This poem, that like the full subject is not revealed until here. What's this poem about? It's about war. The spoils of war. Spoils of war is a familiar phrase. That's a choice to use such a familiar phrase. The spoils of war is normally associated with what you get when you win a war. However, she turns it on its head right here because the spoils of war becomes very negative. That's another choice. That's the twelfth one. The spoils of war turns a familiar, we could call it a familiar idiom on its head, reverses the meaning, which is irony. Because it's not the expected meaning of a phrase, spoils of war. The spoils of war, okay, so that's 12 irony. It's also structure 13. Because she didn't reveal the full subject until the last stanza. So I'm going to make that 13. Subject revealed. Spoils of war is our knowledge of the world. So now we're back to the, we knew the world, backwards and forwards. Now maybe we're starting to get a sense of what this ellipsis is. We knew the world backwards and forwards, but then the world changed. Poisoned wells, bitter bread. Bitter bread is alliteration. On the B, 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 which draws emphasis, attention to bitter bread, that becomes 14. Choice. We knew the world backwards and forwards, so small it fit in a handshake. The world, we knew the world, our knowledge of the world fit in a handshake. So easy, it could be described in a smile. So this is the world before the war. This is the world after the war. Well, knowing that Wisława Zimbroszka is a Polish poet who lived through World War II, we can assume that this is World War II that she's talking about. The world changed, our knowledge of the world. So large it fits in a handshake, so hard. So the world became larger, became harder, and became stranger. Did I say that flung dirty sand in our eyes? Oh, I talked about that as personification, but that's also an image. That's also an image. So image is any time that a piece of writing, phrase, appeals to the senses so that you say to yourself, oh, I, I could imagine what that would feel like or smell like or sound like. Flung dirty sand in our eyes is an image. What kind of language do we have here? Is it harsh language? That's a little harsh there. Is there a shift in tone? Those are things we want to look for when we're thinking about the choices. We knew the world backwards and forwards, so small it fit in a handshake. The interesting thing, triumphant fanfare. So what I'm trying to do is think, how, how should these words sound? How do they sound to the ear? Do they sound harsh? This one sounds a little bit, 
little bit harsh, but it certainly could be harsher. Ahead of us were distant roads leading nowhere. It's still kind of quiet, still kind of somber, ponderous, thinking, thoughtful, poisoned wells, bitter bread. There's a little bit of shift. I think it's just a little bit of a sense that this war was hard. We knew the world backwards and forwards, so small it fit in a handshake. So the world here is kind of acting as a metaphor, you know? So that is like a choice number 15. World is a bit of a, it's a bit of a metaphor. You know, it's not, she's, she's not talking about a literal world. You know, anytime you're talking about knowing the world, so it's kind of like a concept. We knew the concept of the world. But then these become very concrete. So this is another thing you want to always look for in any poem is like, and this is also a, a big source of confusion when you're reading a poem, is concrete versus abstract. Concrete is something that that happens to a person, something that you could feel, something you could touch, something you could grab. Abstract is something like a concept, like the world, like knowing the world. That's a very abstract idea. A handshake is something that's very concrete. Described in a smile is a little bit figurative. It's a little bit, you know, because if you said, I could describe the world in a smile. I could describe the world in a smile. I could describe, the world is so easy, I could describe it in a smile. So the transformation, so what is ultimately changed here? What, what has changed? And this is maybe where the full impact and meaning of this poem happens, is that this has changed. This means something different. This means something different. And this means something different. Old truths and a prayer. So these things, which are concepts that smiles, handshakes, and truth. So, so, so comparison is another thing that we can talk about. It's a style. Like she has implied a comparison between these three, these three things in the way that she structured the poem. So what is that? 16? No, 17. 17 is handshake, smile, old truths, and a prayer. Handshake, smile, old truths, and a pr prayer. So what are these things? What's the relationship of what is a handshake for? What do we do with our smiles? What are the echoes of old truths in prayers? Uh, those are the kind of questions that the poem is inviting you to think about. Um, so what does it mean ultimately? So we've talked about choices. What does it mean and what kind of global issues are involved? Well, war, the aftermath of war, uh, the recovery from war, the changes that war brings culturally. These are cultural changes, what these things mean. Oh, as plain, it's plain. Oh, here's a, as, this is a simile. You know, if you're just trying to, sometimes, I mean, and you do this, and I do it, and people do it, it's like you're just like, I can, I, I've got the code figured out. I can unlock the secret of every line by giving it a special name, like simile, as plain, comparison. So easy, so small. They're all comparisons to we knew the world. We knew the world. How did we know the world? Well, it was so easy it could be described in a smile. But then the world changed and it was so hard it could be described in a smile, which is maybe where we get a little feeling of redemption through here. So what is she saying about this global issue? It might be like, we'll survive. Because these things change, but these things didn't. So these things, handshakes, smiles, old truths and prayers, are what we have, the community of humans, the things that bring us together, the things that matter the most. They didn't change. What they meant changed. And that might be hard. That might be sad, that might be poisoned will, wills and bitter bread, but a smile, but the, but the smiles are still there. They, just, they mean something different. So hard, 
So, so there's a smile of, you know, it means something different. So there's global issues. Meaning, you could go a lot of different directions on the meaning of this poem. I find the meaning of this poem to have something to do with this persistence of human um, community and, uh, and truths. It didn't say that the old truths didn't exist anymore. It just said, it just looked at those truths in a different way, as strange. And maybe those echoes of old truths and prayers are strange, whatever that means.